Number 111. <clears throat> Let us sing. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace is in our sin and our guilt. The under of Calvary's mouth now poured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace.
Again, good evening. Good to see Brother Pardee and Sister Dorothy here with us this evening. So grateful that everything turned out good. We're going to have to postpone our sermon series that we were studying. I had misplaced my sermon outline for the night, so I had to go with a backup plan. So This evening's lesson will be on the method of change. Becoming a Christian is the single biggest change a person will undertake in their life. Many are led to believe that they are already close. They just need to make a few changes. Even the best person living is sinful and not even remotely close to Jesus. A clear indication of this fact is the number of people falling away right to denominationalism without even a change of thought pattern. Only a person that is not taught would depart from the Lord's church to one started by a man. Excuse me, I read that wrong. Only a person that has not taught the biblical pattern for the church and about the singular nature of the church would depart from the Lord's church and to one started by a man. Those who will still have doubts about the Lord will have, will have not yet been fully converted. The numbers falling away are in direct relation to the soundness of the teaching they receive. Starting to change early is essential. The earliest we can change to be better for Christ, the better. Ron Butterfield once said in the Fried Harmon Lectures in 1993, he said the effectiveness of the teaching of the Master directly related to his mission. He had a clear and realistic view of what he was about and never strayed from his pursuit. He had a cross to conquer and disciples to train. His methods included modeling, mentoring, and mission-mindedness. The first thing we have to do to, to change is that we have to have a change of mind. A total cleaning out of the mind. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. Paul was writing to the church at Corinth. The Bible says in verse 16, For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. We need to change to have the mind of Christ. We need to have the mind of seeking and saving that which was lost. We need to have the mind of praying and doing the things that God needs us to do. We need to have the mind of that there are souls worth saving. You need to clean all the sin out of your mind. Clean all the things other than Jesus. Other than what is uh, what is worthy. Take everything that you know far is unscriptural out of your mind. Because if you put garbage in, you will get garbage out. Error taught by respected people is the hardest to let go. And this is a problem we, we see all over the world. Tradition. You know, some sometimes that we sometimes are uh, we see people that that say I've I've got my own church I go to, and one of the reasons why is because maybe their mom and dads went to, went to that church. They follow what their family's done. Maybe they've listened to, maybe they've heard about this great man, how he's a preacher of, how he claims he's a preacher of God, and yet he's, yet he's taught, t teaching things that's unscriptural. Just because you put on a suit doesn't mean you're worthy. Just because I put on a suit doesn't, doesn't make the message any better. It's not the way the person is dressed or how the person seems to be. It's the message that he speaks. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 45, error learned. You have heard that it was said, speaking, speaking of the old prophets and you heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Error learned. You know, the people that he was talking to, this is part of his Sermon on the Mount. 
It said, you have heard it was said of old. You shall love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those that persecute you. Other words, Jesus said, that's what the way it was of old. But I say to you, to love your enemy. Pray for those that persecute you. Why do you suppose Jesus said that? What was Jesus' mission? To seek and to save that which was lost. What should be our mission? To seek and to save that which was lost. And to edify and build up the church. And remain faithful. Context, context, context. Romans chapter 10 verse 2. In Romans 10, verse 2. When I start, actually, I'm going to start with verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire, my prayer to God for them, that is, speaking of Israel, is for their salvation. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. Yes, the, the, the people of Israel, they, they love God, yes, but they didn't have knowledge of God. They didn't have knowledge. We have a lot of when we when we speak when we are uh, having Bible studies with, with maybe a person who's straight away maybe a person that's lost. Are we just picking one scripture and sugarcoating it? I've heard it was said, and I think I've got it from Facebook. I don't know where I've got it from. It says sugarcoated preaching is dangerous to your soul. Whenever we speak to individuals or whenever we speak to those that are lost to have Bible studies, we need to read everything in its con context. For example, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith. People will say that and say, look, I'm saved by grace. You've got to read the context. You've got to know that that statement was, wasn't written to the lost. That was written to Christians, to the church at Ephesus. Whenever you people think of John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. People say they'll read that, ver that verse, and all you have to do is believe. Wait a minute, you've got to look at John, uh, the first part of the chapter. Nicodemus, you must be born again. That's baptism. That's obviously, it's a whole lot more than believing. After all, seeing is believing, right? Seeing the word for yourself. Looking at the context. Misunderstood and misexplained scriptures show conflict. Look at Matthew chapter 22, verse 29. But Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not understanding the scriptures nor the power of God. Now in this, in this context, let's not just take the scripture alone. In this context, Jesus is answering the, the Sadducees. If you look at verse 23, it says, On that day some Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to Jesus and questioned him. Asking teacher, Moses said, If a man dies having no children, his brother as next of kin shall marry his wife and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers with us, and the first married and died and having no children led his wife to his brother. And also the second and third down to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had married her. Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken not understanding the scriptures nor the power of God. Misunderstood and misexplained scriptures show conflict. The Sadducees showed that example. They misunderstood the context of that, of that passage. We cannot misunderstand the passage. If you have trouble misunderstanding something, ask, read, study. We must replace that empty space. When we clean out of our mind, we must replace it with what? Knowledge of the Scriptures. You know when Peter said, Add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge self-control. How do we add to our faith? By studying God's Word. A filter is now in place. 
Test the spirits. First John chapter 4, verse 1. John writes, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Verse 2, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you have heard that is coming and now is already in the world. Do not believe every spirit. What does that? What is? What is? What does uh, John say about? Why is John saying that? Because they're all false teachers out in this world. Have to there a lot. Sadly, it's a lot. Whenever a man of God or a man or a person steps steps in this pulpit and preaches the message of God, we should test them. How do we test them? By looking at the scriptures along with the speaker. By looking at the scriptures yourself. By listening to what the speaker is saying. By listening to what, what the preacher is saying. It doesn't matter if I'm standing up here or Brother Jerry is preaching or Brother Roger Leonard's preaching or Brother Bill Ward's preaching. It doesn't matter who's preaching. Is the message being taught? Is the preacher preaching the truth? We can find out by looking at the scripture, following along with him. You know, I've once heard a sermon, and the whole time, not one scripture was mentioned. Not one. And a lot, and a lot of the, a lot of the, a lot of the people that heard the message said, "You did a great sermon today." I thought hmm. he didn't mention one verse. No, not one. What a sad, sad thing. Men proclaiming to be preachers of God. Men, men claiming to be men of God, and yet they're preaching wickedness. Preaching this. Examine whether it be so. Acts chapter 17, verse 11. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. For they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Examine the scriptures. Examine. Our past gospel meeting, Brother J.T. Brown uh, did a lesson on studying our Bible. Why Bible study is so important. And I know Brother Jerry's talked about it too. Study our Bible. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Timothy. Paul wrote that to Timothy. Study plus work equals growth. Equals growth. You will grow. If you study and do the work, study and do the, do the work that God wants us to do, if you obey His will, studying the Scriptures daily, you'll grow. People say, I, I can't grow. Study. Add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. You will grow. A change of mind that leads to a change of direction. So we've come, we've come from cleaning out our mind to adding the things of Christ in. Now we're going a total different direction. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. Many people never use it. They rely on others. Take it from Brother Bill Davis. He's an elder down in Jacksonville. He's spoken at many gospel meetings and I've heard him speak. And he said that uh, brethren, brothers and sisters, do not let your elders or your preachers or your deacons do your Bible study for you. Study the scriptures for yourselves. Get to know Jesus for yourselves. Get to know God for yourselves. Many compare themselves to the wrong standard. In other words, men, they come up with all kinds of ways. They twist scripture to their liking. God's Word means what it says and says what it means. Add thou not to His Word, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2, nor take from it. God seeks proper direction, not perfection. That means that you don't have to be perfect. 
None of us know, know the Scriptures from beginning to end. We all don't understand everything. But He seeks. He knows your heart. He tries your heart. Jeremiah 17, 10. Or 10, 17. I can't remember, I can't remember what, that verse. I the Lord search the heart. I try the reins. God knows our ever thought. What's our motive? Is our motive to learn more of God or is our motive just to be like the scribes and Pharisees and just try to trick people up? God knows our motives. The impossibility of a return trip. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 26. Brother Eddie read, read this a moment ago. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 26. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Wait a minute. I thought if you weren't saved, you're always saved. Nope. Again, why was the book of Hebrews written? Or if we go on sinning willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, after we, after we have obeyed God's will, there remains no, or no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Which means if we go on and sin willfully, this be like me of the world. You are separated from God. Paul looked at things accomplished as rubbish. Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, I count all but loss. Let's look at that. Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so I, that I may gain Christ. Do you surrender all to Jesus, or do you give Him half or one-fourth? Jesus wants our all. We've got to know how to surrender to Jesus. The narrow path has no U-turn policy. You can't make a U-turn. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate of destruction. And many that be, be there. Second thing, in order to change, we have to have a change of model. Jesus walked the walk, but many just taught the talk. Matthew chapter 5, verse 19. Some of you may be familiar with this passage. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Wouldn't you like to be called great in the kingdom of heaven? Of course, no one likes to be called least or, or last or terrible. Who want to be called great? By keeping and teaching others the truth. If you abide in my, my, uh, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. John 8. Verse 32, 31 and 32. Jesus realized the importance of works and words being tied together. The religious leaders of his day and ours don't get it. They don't get the words of Jesus. Of course, they're, they're, that seems like to me they're trying to get rid of him. Get rid of God in the Bible and what does is, what is the nation become? Corrupt. This isn't the first that's, that's happened, brethren. It's happened all over the world. In Jesus' time, since the beginning. And, and Jesus, uh, he, uh, in Matthew chapter 23, he confronted those religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees. He did not play with them. He didn't come out and say, well, 
All, uh, they, didn't, they didn't sugarcoat it. If you want to look some someone that doesn't sugarcoat preaching, look at Jesus in Matthew chapter 23. He brought the hammer down. Traditions overpower inspiration. We don't need to preach according to traditions, but preach according to the word. We don't need to teach according to traditions, but teach in, or, in order to the words. It may be a tradition to sing sing with instrumental music. That don't make that don't make it truth. He not only taught as one having authority, he modeled the example. Acts chapter 1 verse 1. The first account I composed the office about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Until the day when he, had, he was taken up to heaven, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. Jesus walked the walk and he taught the talk. He taught as one having authority. He modeled the example. He was the perfect sacrifice for sins. In order for people to follow into leadership, spiritual maturity, today we must lead by the divine pattern. 1 Timothy 1.16 Let's look at 1 Timothy 1.16 Yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate His per perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in Him for eternal life. He had perfect patience. Jesus was a patient man. God is patient towards us. Second Peter 3 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness. But the long suffering of our Lord and Savior is that all men should come to repentance. God is long-suffering. He is patient. Jesus is patient. He was patient with us. We should be patient with others. We should be patient when we teach the lost. We should have patience when we're trying to teach those who don't know God. You can't just jump right in and say, well, you're lost because you you're not this. We have to show compassion. Do we show compassion or do we show anger, frustration? Condemnation. Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. It's in the Gospel of John. Titus chapter 2 verse 7. In Titus chapter 2 verse 7. Bible says, In all things show yourself to be an example of good deeds, with purity and doctrine dignified. Sound in speech was beyond reproach that, that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. Are you ready to give an answer to those that question us? Are we prepared to give an answer to those that question us? How do I, what must I, brothers and brethren, what must I do to be saved? Can you answer that question? We have those out there that's, that's actually wanting to know what must I do to be saved? If we were asked that question tonight, are you prepared to answer it? If not, we've got some reading and studying to do. Teaching is having authority from God's Word. In order for people to follow into leadership, spiritual maturity today, we must teach as having authority. We must have authority. Be not ashamed to teach the gospel. That's what Paul said in Romans chapter 1 verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Are we ashamed or are we on fire for it? Are we ready to show people that there is a better way to live? In order for people to follow into leadership, spiritual maturity today, we must be willing to hold leaders and followers accountable. Romans 16, 17.
Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dis dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned, and turn away from them. For such, men's, for such men are slaves, not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. Prime example, our government. Prime example, Barack Obama. Prime example, example Pontius Pilate. There's a lot of examples we can point out. I wish, matter of fact, I pray that our government would turn from their wickedness, turn from their decisions they've made to allow same-sex marriage, to allow such, to allow abortion. Year after year, many babies are being killed. That is sad. America is sick. It's sinfully sick. Running around, not knowing what, what right is or what wrong is, it seems like. Running around having fun, having a party. But you know what will happen to them that do not repent? They will go to hell if they do not repent. They will go to hell, plain and simple. Brothers and sisters, we need, we need more hell, fire, and brimstone preaching. We need to hear more sermons on hell. We preach about heaven a lot, but we do not preach on hell. Less sermons on hell. Let's give them he heaven and encouragement. Let's give them feel-good sermons. No, we've got to preach the word, of the whole counsel of God. Hell is real. Heaven is real. We need to lead people to heaven. But by doing so, we need to let them know that there is a hell. And that if you do not obey the will of God, hell is where, and you do not repent from your sins, hell is where you're going. Period. And I will continue to say that, and I don't care what the government has to say. They say you could, if you preach on that people are going to hell if they don't repent from God, they will kill you. Well, you might as well kill me. We need to have that kind of attitude. Amen. We need to have the attitude of Jesus Christ. Jesus died for preaching the gospel, preaching of himself, and he broke no laws. What a sad world we live in. Great leaders always go first. Matthew chapter 11, verse 11. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not been arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of, great, of heaven is greater than he. Talking of servants. Are we servants of God or are we slaves of sin? Do we serve God or are we lukewarm? Where are you sitting? Where do you stand? Jesus taught in their cities. And we, we see that all throughout the, the Gospels of Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He would demonstrate proper personal work among, among their friends. He never asked them or us to do something He was not willing to do. Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Let's look at Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. If Jesus could do it, so can we. We have no excuse. God became flesh in a human body, walking and teaching those, seeking and save those which was lost. He had the courage. He was willing to die, and many of the apostles did. Do you have that type of attitude? His example is our God today. John, John chapter 3 and verse 4. John chapter 3, 3 and 4. There's a conversion with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Let's look at John chapter 3 for one moment. I'm not going to go into specific detail about John chapter 3, but I do want to look at it for a moment. One of the biggest passages of the Bible.
Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time in his mother's womb and be born, can he? But Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Nicodemus looked for Jesus. He came to Jesus at night. He was a Jew. He was a man. He had position and education. He was a ruler of the Jews. He was educated. He was morally upright. But Jesus said, you lack one thing. You lack one thing. Unless one is born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That takes down many of the people that don't believe in baptism on it. Unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You know, uh, I can't remember uh, what preacher told, uh, said this in a sermon. I think it was Glenn Colley. He said he studied with a... With a no, it, was, it was Brother Bill Dedman that said this. He said he studied... Or he was talking with uh, someone and he said... Uh, what do you suppose water meant in John chapter 3? He said, buttermilk. Just think, just think of that. Buttermilk. Our we're supposed to be born of buttermilk and spirit. That's crazy. That is what the scripture says. The scripture says of water and the spirit. So the water we drink, that's buttermilk? I don't think water comes from the cow. What kind of near-minded man would that be? We must heed the scriptures and know the truth. The truth will set us free. Free from what? Free from sin. The, con the conversion with the Samaritan woman. Look at John chapter 4. There came a woman of Samaria, this is the first seven, and said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you being a Jew ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you do the gift of God, and who, is, who, it, who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you? Who gave us the well, and drank of it himself, and his sons, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Do you want that living water? Do you have that living water? Will never thirst again. The earthly water we will thirst for. But for heaven, we will never be thirsty. Heaven will surely be worth it all. We see in the conversion of the Samaritan woman that the Samaritan woman was, was not looking for Jesus. Her visit was in the middle of the day. She was a Samaritan. She was a woman. She was nobody. She was just a Samaritan woman. She was living in sin. And Jesus pointed that out. Remember, remember uh, Jesus told her to go call thy husband? And she said, Sir, I have no, I have no husband. She said, You are right, you have no husband for the one you are with now is... I can't let's see. For the one you have now, when you have now is not your husband. This you have said truly, sir. I perceive that you are a prophet. So now that she knows that who Jesus was, she was a Samaritan. She was living in sin. Jesus was the master teacher because he taught every person that would listen. It doesn't matter what time of day, time of night, he was there to listen. Finally, we must have a change of mentor. Jesus was a perfect mentor, an experienced person in a company or educational institution who trains and counsels new employees or students. That's an example. 
Jesus provides the correct information to his disciples. Jesus, Jesus used scripture to teach and correct. When you look at Matthew chapter four, you see it, see it, see it all in that all in that chapter. Jesus provided knowledge through tra through training. Matthew chapter fourteen, verses twenty two and twenty three. He allowed experiences to build faith in his teaching. Matthew chapter fourteen, verses thirty two and thirty three. Some would not follow his membership. Remember Judas? He betrayed him. He didn't follow him. He betrayed him. The rich young ruler in Matthew chapter 19 and Mark 10. He wouldn't sell everything everything for the kingdom. Our religious leaders of the day, the Pope, the Muslims, I mean, all the false teachers, Joel Osteen, T.D. Jakes, a lot of, a lot of them false, false teachers, they're not following his mentorship. They're preaching false. Teaching is a two-way street. Proverbs 22, verse 6. Let's look at Proverbs 22, verse 6. I believe the passage says, Train up a child in the way you should go. I may be wrong. Maybe That may be a different passage than I'm thinking of. Train up a child in the way you should go. Even when it is old, you will not depart from it. That's, that, that's, that's what I thought it was. Train up a child. Train up one to be in the kingdom. That's the teaching. Teaching occurs when the teacher teaches and the student apply the teaching to behavior, attitude, and the achieving our knowledge. Peter and Andrew dropped their nets to follow. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 20. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. They followed along. Jesus taught how to pray in secret. In, in secret. Matthew chapter 6 verse 5. When you pray, do not be like the heathen. Jesus taught them how to go and teach effectively. Matthew chapter 10 verses 1 through 17. When Jesus taught, it was with, with authority. He was given all authority. Matthew chapter twenty-eight, verse eighteen. All authority in heaven, all authority on, in heaven and on earth has been given to, my, given to me. His teaching displayed authority. Matthew chapter seven, verse twenty-nine. His teaching was not like the scribes. The scribes and Pharisees they sat on Moses' seat. They found the best plates, and, uh, best places in the synagogues to sit down. They did everything to be seen of men. They prayed long pretentious, pretentious prayers. And Jesus not once did any of that. Why? Because he knew better. And if the and if the Jews there, the, 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 if the scribes and Pharisees would have read the scripture and would truly understand what the scripture said, they wouldn't have done it either. In conclusion, God still declared, desires those who would follow Jesus to make significant changes to their lives. Jesus has left us a perfect pattern to follow in making those changes. Jesus, as the master teacher, taught there has to be a change in our mind, model, and mentor if we are trying to be pleasing to the Father. Unless we are willing to change and pattern our life after, after His, we cannot be His disciple. It makes me cringe, almost, to see a child of God turn away from the truth. One who has, been, one who has taught the truth knows the truth, but decides to turn back into the world. This makes me cringe. Like I said, we need more sermons on hell and on sin. More than on heaven. America, God's Word is what America needs now. It needs it very seriously. So tonight, maybe you're a child of God, maybe you've prayed from the path. Maybe you've fallen away from the church, or maybe you've had to, had to think, think about it. Am I truly following Jesus? Have I given everything up for Jesus? Would I sell all my possessions for Jesus? <clears throat> Would I take a bullet for Jesus? Would I die for Jesus? Are you, are you saved? If not, then be saved over tonight. Maybe you're not a child of God, and maybe you want to become a child of God. Become a member of church, where you can do like those, the big bit on Acts on the day of Pentecost. You can hear the word of God, Romans 10, 17, and you can believe, 
John 8, 24, you can repent. Repent and be baptized. Repent later one of you. Be baptized for, for the remission of sins. And you remain faithful unto death. <coughs> Revelation 6, <coughs> I don't know your hearts, but God knows. Jesus is the great physician. And he is there for us, whatever, no matter what case may be. If, we have, if you have anything that you need or if, if we can help you with, please come down and stand as we sing the song of invitation. I hear the Savior say, I drink and hear his